Welcome to this week's Independent Sage Briefing. It is the start of a new academic year and over the coming weeks students will start to make their way back to universities and colleges across the country. On the 17th of August the UK government lifted all remaining requirements for social distancing within higher education settings leaving universities free to resume face-to-face teaching. While many will re- welcome this return to normality there are still questions to be answered about the impact that that will have on infection rates, which are currently running at significantly higher levels than they were this time last year, of course. So is it possible to resume higher education as it was before the pandemic hit without causing a potential spike in infections? What measures need to be in place to ensure the safety of students and staff at our universities and, of course, the wider communities that host them? Elizabeth Stocko is Professor of Social Interaction at Loughborough University and a member of the Independent Sage Behavioural Group, and she'll be presenting the latest report on universities, and you can read that in full over on our website as well. But before we get into that discussion, Professor Christina Pargel is going to present the latest facts and figures, and then Professor Martin McKee is going to talk briefly about a new report commissioned by the WHO about how Europe can rebuild after the pandemic. So that's plenty from me. Over to you, Christina. Okay, let me share my screen. Right. So um, today, I'm going to be going over you know, the usual vaccinations, cases, hospitalizations and deaths. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at children in particular, and then just a couple of slides on the international picture. Um, So vaccination data, this is now where we are in terms of total population vaccinated in each of the home nations, Um, over 60% in all nations and almost at 70% in Scotland and Wales. So Scotland and Wales have the highest rates of vaccination so just bear that in mind when we look at cases later but we still have you know about a quarter to a third in northern ireland of the population that is unvaccinated um, and that is still quite substantial just looking at first dose uptake by age for england to 8th of september um, i'm just showing this really to highlight that since um, 16 and 17 year olds became eligible Um, In August, there has been quite rapid uptake. So I think there is certainly demand in in young people to get vaccinated. Um, And as universities go back, uh, 18 to 24 year olds are somewhere around 70% have had one dose, but that still does leave quite a few people who are unprotected from vaccination. Public Health England yesterday released a new report, which they're going to be releasing every week from now, which is looking at cases, hospitalizations and deaths by age and vaccination status, which I think is really useful. Um, And this is a chart of the number of hospitalizations with COVID in England by vaccination status and age. And you can see that in, in under 18s, almost all hospitalizations are in unvaccinated. And as you move to older age groups, you end up with most submissions being people who are fully vaccinated. Now, sometimes people have used this to say, okay, what does that mean? The vaccination isn't working. It doesn't mean that. What this is reflecting is that most people who are over 60 have been vaccinated, well over 90% are fully vaccinated. So you just don't have that many unvaccinated people left to get sick. And if we did have that, um, Sorry, someone just tried to call me. Um, And if you did have that, then these numbers would be way, way, way higher. And they're not. And what PHE then did is they looked at um, the number of hospitalizations by age, by vaccination state, depending on the underlying number of people who've been vaccinated, not vaccinated. And when you do that, you get this picture. So these white bars are the rates of hospitalizations per 100,000 people in unvaccinated and the black bars are if you've been vaccinated and you can see that in all cases vaccination is incredibly protective against hospitalization Um, and so if you're if if you're over 80 you can see here that the vaccinated people are much much less likely to need hospital it's just that there are many more of them so that's why when you look at the overall numbers it seems higher what you can also see here is that what a vaccination does 
is it cuts your risk, but it can't cut it completely. So a fully vaccinated 80 year old still has um, about the same rate of hospitalization as an unvaccinated 50 year old. So it kind of gives you the risk of someone 30 years younger is effectively what vaccination does. So you should definitely get vaccinated. It still means that there is still some risk, especially for older age groups. So looking at cases, this is the um, number of new confirmed COVID cases in the UK by reported dates of people who had a positive test to the 9th of September. Um, and you can see um, it's been going up pretty steadily since August. And I just thought we could look at it by wave and what that means in terms of total cases. So in, the, in last autumn, um, so this is from September to 1st of December, we had a total of 1.3 million confirmed cases. And then alpha hit in early December and we had the massive alpha wave, which was brought under control by the January long lockdown. And in that wave up to the 1st of March, we had two and a half million confirmed cases um, in the UK. Then we had a kind of a respite in March. We were vaccinating. We had restrictions that gradually got lifted, but also we started having Delta. So in this, we had only about 280,000 cases. And then from May onwards, Delta was um, dominant um, in the UK and we opened up and we had the, the big July surge and we're going up again, but we've had really, really high cases for actually several months now. And so since the middle of May, we've actually had 2.7 million cases of COVID. And this is, you know, in a highly vaccinated population. And this is, you know, we've, we're higher now than the alpha wave. And there's no sign particularly that it's going to come down anytime soon. Um, and this has led to hospitalizations, which we'll see later, but it will also mean that we are still creating quite a high burden of long COVID in many people with these really high case rates. Looking at the um, home nations, I should say per week, not per eat, but anyway, um, Scotland has by far the highest uh, case rates at the moment and is going up 800 per 100,000 people per week. Northern Ireland and Wales are actually about the same case rates, but Northern Ireland is coming down and Wales is going up. Um, and England has gone up slightly, but is the lowest and the flattest of the home nations at the moment. But every home nation is far, far, far higher than it was a year ago. And if we just look at positivity rates, we can see there is quite a different picture between Wales and Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland had this really massive peak in July and August, but that has now coming down the positivity rate. Wales is seeing this really high positivity rate of almost 20% of people tested are testing positive, which suggests that actually case rates in Wales are probably higher than in Northern Ireland because they're just not testing enough. Scotland has gone up. It's about 13, 14% um, positivity rate. In, and England has really been very flat at 8% for several months now. So, this is just a map of where cases are. So you can see Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales are now all quite high. And then the north of England, again, is now seeing higher case rates in parts of the Midland. The southwest had that big surge a few weeks ago. That is abating, but parts of the southwest still remain very high in case rate. And just looking at it um, in England now by age, cases are kind of quite flat now in people over 60. It kind of came down in 20 to 59 year olds and it just started going up again, but we're seeing quite steep increases in under 20 year olds um, just over the last few weeks. And I'll be going back to that later. Um, so hospitalizations and deaths. This is the number of people in hospital per million people uh, for the UK nations. And you can see Northern Ireland um, with its really big spike in cases did have really high rates of hospitalization actually that are still climbing. Um, England has been flattish but going up, steadily going up because even if admissions stay constant because people stay a few days in hospital when they're sick, it adds to the occupancy and as you people keep coming in then basically beds keep getting fuller and occupancy goes up. But both Scotland and Wales who've seen quite sharp increases in cases recently are now seeing really sharp increases in hospital occupancy. So, so yes, you know, the PHE charts show that the link between 
cases and um, and hospitalizations has got weaker because of vaccination, but it definitely definitely hasn't been broken. And so, if you have really high case rates, you will end up with people going to hospital. And this is just looking at England, the number of hospital admissions is um, admissions, not number of people in hospital. Um, oh, I've just put the wrong title on. Anyway, it says number of admissions to England. And you can see again, we had a sharp increase since the 17th of May that kind of came with the Delta wave. And really over the summer, we saw a small dip after the 19th of July, but it went back up and it stayed really high. So we're getting somewhere about 800 a day. We're currently adding about 5,000 new admissions a week, and we've had 53,000 people admitted since the 17th of May. It's not cases without consequence. And if we just look at it by region, what I want to do here is show that the Northeast had that massive spike in cases um, in July. And, and that kind of spike has eased off, but the number of people in hospital in the Northeast hasn't really, and they have far higher rates of occupancy than other English regions. So there is quite a lot of disparity again in, in where that burden on the NHS is being felt. Looking at deaths within 28 days of a positive test um, to the 10th of September, this is um, obviously the winter peak and we're nowhere near that. And that is entirely because of vaccination. And that is really, really good. But we have been going up um, since the spring. We're now averaging over 130 deaths a day. So almost a thousand deaths a week. And since the 1st of July, we've had over five and a half thousand people dying of COVID. So again, it's not, um, there's a consequence to having the number of cases that we've been having. So looking at children, and I'm going to start with Scotland because in Scotland, schools went back around the 19th of August. So a few weeks before they went back in England. So this is confirmed cases in under 15 year olds per week in Scotland, a rolling seven day average. And it goes up to the 5th of September because we're looking at it by date of test. So what you can see here, this is um, the alpha spike at the end of uh, the year last year. This is a small bump that happened when schools went back in March and then they came down in the holidays. Schools went back in April and cases were low in the community, but nothing. Um, so schools were very flat. Kids could be in education. There wasn't really much of an issue. And then Delta started taking over and we started opening up um, in Scotland as well. And you can see cases went up quite rapidly towards the end of term, which was the end of June in Scotland. In the school holidays, cases came back down again, but started going up just before kids went back to school. And then schools opened um, around the 17th, 18th of August. And since then, really, cases in under 15s have shot up. So, you know, 1,600 per 100,000 per week means like, you know, almost 2% of the population testing positive every week in, in this age of children. Um, it looks like it might be slightly tapering off, but it's still an incredibly steep increase. And some of it, yes, they're doing mass testing, but it definitely is not all just testing. You can also look at 15 to 19 year olds. So remember, this isn't quite correlating with schools because many 15 to 19 year olds have left school. Um, and they also uh, are much more likely to go out to pubs and clubs and festivals and all the rest of it and mix that way. So, but you see kind of similar patterns. You see a big spike um, at the end of June. This is actually kind of the Euro spike probably. And then they started going up very, very steeply after Scotland did its final opening on the 9th of August and then continued to go up really, really steeply. And the most recent week has seen um, a slight dip there. But what you're seeing with these really high infection rates in young people is impact. So this is the number of hospital admissions in under 18s in Scotland per week. So in the um, alpha wave, there was an increase um, around New Year when we had that peak, but it wasn't a massive one. Um, slight increase when schools went back, very quiet over Easter and, and early spring. And then with Delta, it started going up towards the end of term, school holidays brought things down again. But when schools went back, the week that schools went back, the admissions were still quite high. I mean, relatively, I mean, they're obviously much lower than they are in adults, but they were as high as they were in the January peak. 
And then in the week, in the two weeks since, hospital admissions in under 18s have really shot up. They're far higher than they've ever been, almost three times higher than they were in January. Um, and and yes, you know, again, it's not massive numbers, but it is showing that yes, when you, you know, when enough children get infected, you will end up with children that, that do need to go to hospital. And we're also seeing that school absences in Scotland since the start term, it's only been a couple of weeks, have gone up a lot. So when schools went back in August, it was about 5% of children were off school, very few with COVID. And now two weeks later, about 5% are off directly because of COVID and quite a few are off for other reasons, which they don't know, authorised and unauthorised. And um, there's certainly anecdotes about parents keeping their children off when they hear about an outbreak. But this is... 13% of children being absent um, at the beginning of this week. And that compares to about 25% of children being absent at the end of the previous term. But that was a situation where schools were isolating bubbles. So if there was a case, they'd isolate the whole year group. We're not doing that now. No, no country, in, uh, none of the home nations are doing that. So this is even without that, you've got 13% of children off school. So... Looking going back to England and looking at case rates in under 19s in England, um, we can see this is kind of the previous two waves, the kind of autumn wave when we went back in September. This big black one is kind of the big university spike that we had. And um, let's hope we don't get that this time. I mean, Liz will be talking about that later. We can see the big end of December alpha spike in schools here, particularly for five to nine year olds and 10 to 14 year olds. And this is a slight back to school spike in March. And here we're seeing the Delta spike that happened at the end of June. And in all of the three age groups, you had more cases by far than you had um, in the previous spikes. Now, again, part of that is better case ascertainment because we're testing, but part of it is just because Delta is incredibly infectious. It came down in the holidays, but it's been going up steadily in August. Schools went back at the end of last week none of these numbers are because of the impact of schools opening. We have yet to see that impact in England. And this is what hospital admissions are like. And again, we're actually in a very similar position to where Scotland was when schools went back there, and that um, hospitalizations in children are actually relatively very high. They are exactly the same levels that were at the previous peak at the end of last year. And this is where we're going in to school with. Um, and if the same pattern happens here, then in Scotland, you will see these rates go up quite rapidly this, this month. So, you know, I mean, I hope it doesn't happen, but we actually have fewer mitigations in schools in Scotland and we have high case rates and unvaccinated um, children. So, um, and then just looking at the United States. So the, the CDC there also released a report about hospital admissions in under 18s there. Um, this went up to 21st of August. So this is a month that's missing 10 days, so a third. And it had a um, percentage of hospitalizations almost as high as they saw in the peak. Um, and one of the things that's happened in the US is that they are vaccinating teenagers, but it's a very um, differential uptake between the North and the South. So effectively in, um, in Republican states, there's much lower uptake than there is in the Democratic states in the Northeast and, and, the, and the West. And they're seeing far fewer children getting sick and also needing hospital. And the CDC did another analysis that came out end of last week, where they said that firstly, hospitalization rates among children and adolescents have risen five times between June to August. And they also said that hospitalization rates were 10 times higher among unvaccinated children compared to fully vaccinated children. So the vaccines in teenagers do work and they are protecting them against needing hospital. And the CDC also said that it's really important to have preventative measures to reduce transmission and outcomes in children. And that includes vaccination and includes masking in schools. And I just wanted to play you this clip. This is um, Anthony Fauci. He gave a lecture this week to the John Snow Society and someone asked him this question, you know, what do you think about, about children and COVID? And this is what he said. I have to say, I'm giving you just my opinion and not any uh, dispersion on the 
on on the decision that the UK authorities have made, which I know is not the same decision that we've made in the United States. I do believe, Dr. Woodworth, that we should vaccinate the children. And there are a number of reasons. One, that they are vehicles of spread. Two, that we do get some severe disease in children. Right now, if you go to your own media, you will see that in the United States, in the southern states, Florida, Texas, Georgia, Mississippi, the intensive care units in the pediatric hospitals are full. We're almost overrun. I mean, we have a lot of children in hospitals now. So even though relatively speaking, compared to an adult, they do not get as seriously ill. We have lost more children from SARS-CoV-2 than we ever lose for influenza. And we vaccinate children against influenza. So that's one of the reasons. Number two, apropos of a question you asked me a few moments ago, we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on anyone, including children. So it may be that, much to our dismay, that children who get infected have long-term consequences that we don't fully appreciate right now. So for those reasons, one of transmissibility and one of seriousness of disease and one of uncertainty about long-range consequences, I, I come down strongly on ultimately vaccinating our children. I have to say. So that was Dr. Fauci. I'm just going to end on a couple of slides on the international picture. Just comparing the UK to um, countries in Europe. So here, Portugal, Spain, Denmark, Italy, France, and Germany, you can see that all of the countries have high um, proportion of their population fully vaccinated. Portugal currently is the highest. The UK is kind of somewhere in the middle of this group. So all of these countries have high vaccination rates. Now, what we have heard often from, from government ministers is that because Delta is so transmissible, you can't really help having high cases. The high cases is just a consequence and it doesn't really matter because we have vaccination and we can live with it and, and so on. I just want to say that that just is not true, right? This is the um, daily new confirmed COVID cases per million people for the same countries. All of these countries had rising cases because of Delta, France particularly, Portugal, Denmark, um, Spain also had very high rates. All of them have now brought that down. They have Delta under control. And that's not because their vaccines are working better. It's because they also have other things in place. In many of them, they still have masking. They have mitigations in schools. They paid attention to ventilation. And some of them have in place um, COVID passports where you have to have either a vaccine certificate or proof of a negative test or proof that you've had COVID. Um, but or, or, you know they have they have a whole range of measures that they're also using, but they are all still fully open. So it's just this this idea that somehow where we are is inevitable and everybody's going through the same thing is just not true. So right, final slide. Vaccinations are continuing. Sixteen and seventeen year olds have taken it up very well so far. And the next really big questions are kind of vaccinations in 12 to 15 year olds and boosters and kind of decisions on that are expected imminently like today or early next week. And we'll be discussing that next week at IndySage. Cases are high in all nations, particularly Scotland and Wales. And remember, they have the highest vaccination rates. Again, so it's not just you can't just rely on high vaccination rates to keep Delta in check. Um, since Delta took over, we've had over 2.7 million confirmed cases in the UK, which is more than in the winter alpha wave. And we're going up, we're not going down. Hospitalizations are going up slowly in England, falling in Northern Ireland, but going up rapidly in Scotland and Wales. Um, COVID really continues to be a considerable burden on an NHS that's already tired and overloaded, and we're now going into winter. It's been compounded by labour shortages, both in the NHS, where there isn't enough staff anyway, but also there are now several staff that can't work as well because they've got long COVID and social care. And what that's meaning is there was a story about this just yesterday. Um, I think the John Radcliffe in Oxford declared an emergency because they couldn't admit people because they couldn't discharge for our patients into care homes because the care homes weren't staffed enough to look after them. So this is causing 
a big block in our system as we're going into winter with increasing COVID rates. We are out of step with international peers when it comes to vaccinating children and mitigations in schools and hospitalizations in the under 18s are relatively high. Um, the US and Scotland um, and other countries have seen a significant surge in cases and admissions in children on return to school. And there's no reason to think that we're not gonna see the same in England. Um, Israel, where they've had really, really high rates um, in children, have now decided only to open secondary school classes when more than 70% of the children are vaccinated. I think they decided that yesterday. And just finally, you know, many highly vaccinated countries have struggled with Delta, but they are keeping it under control with some additional public health measures. And we are one of the, the countries with the fewest public health protections. But, you know, our high case numbers, they're just not inevitable. They are a policy choice. And I will end there. Thank you very much indeed, Christina, for that um, very clear presentation of the figures as always, and, and also those um, very uh, pertinent comparisons which show us how different what we're doing in the UK is to what the rest of the world is doing, and, and also that comment from, uh, from Dr Anthony Fauci as well, which was very pertinent too. So now we're going to have a few words from Professor Martin McKee about the WHO report on how Europe can rebuild. Martin, over to you. Uh, right, let me just share my screen. Suddenly my printer started printing for some completely bizarre reason there. And um, so there we are. Um, oops. Right, thanks very much indeed, Alice. So I just thought I'd say a few words about a report that we published this morning. And this is something that I've been working on with colleagues over the last year. And it is the report of a commission that was chair. It was asked for by the regional director uh, of WHO for Europe, Hans Kluge. And the commission was chaired by Mario Monti, who is a former Italian prime minister and European commissioner, and had a lot of people who came from outside health. Uh, we had a couple of former prime ministers, former presidents, central bank governors, and that sort of pe person, as well as a small number of health people. And it took a, a new look at what needs to change after the pandemic. There's a report. And there's a review of the evidence, which I pulled together, which is about 180 pages long, and, and which people I thought uh, who watch us might find interesting. So what did we find? Well, I mean, it's no real surprise in some ways, but we set out in detail why uh, we were seeing what we were. The uh, first thing is obvious. Countries in Europe were not adequately prepared for a pandemic that was not just predictable, but had been predicted repeatedly. There were weaknesses in political leadership in many countries. There was underinvestment in healthcare and public health, and too many people were leading precarious lives, and social safety nets were inadequate. This is the conceptual model of health that we have in the report, which we're particularly pleased with because we think it actually captures the need for a holistic, comprehensive approach to understanding health. At the center, of course, we have uh, what we call One Health, the interrelationship between the health of humans, animals, the natural environment, all swimming around in a sea of microorganisms interacting with one another. Everything is wrapped up in planetary health, the things we can't do anything about, like potentially asteroid strikes and things like that, and the things that we can do something about, um, global warming, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and then a whole series of things that can make things better or worse. Things that make things better, of course, housing, nutrition, education, but also digital access that's come out strongly during the pandemic, safe environments. We've been talking a lot about access to justice, trust, and things that make things make the situation worse, trade and harmful commodities, hostile artificial intelligence, disinformation, crime, corruption, racism, many of the issues that we have picked up in independent sage. And just very briefly, because you, there's far too much to cover than I can cover today. What are the key messages? We need to look at the health of humans, animals, and the natural environment together. And we make a series of recommendations as to how to do that. We need to fix the fractures in society that left so many people uh, struggling during the pandemic. 
We do need innovative medicines and technology and models of care, but these must be, uh, they must reflect the real needs. They shouldn't be done just because we've got a new drug that can treat something and make a profit. It is to actually focus on the, the needs of the population. We need to make it easier for governments to invest in public health and health care. And remember, we had a lot of people from the finance sector on the um, on the commission, and they get it. They understand that if you don't invest in public health and health care, you will, as we did in the pandemic, have to pay for it sometime. And we make a series of recommendations for new global governance structures. So I'll just mention it and hope that people, if they want to, can read a bit more about it. And hopefully there's a lot in the evidence review that will give you food for thought. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, now we're going to go over to our main discussion of the day, which is about universities and um, the situation this year. And to introduce and kick off today's discussion, we're going to Professor Liz Stocko. So Liz, over to you. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see my slides. So since this time last year, uh, almost a year exactly, IndieSage has produced several reports about universities and together they present accumulated and evolving evidence to underpin recommendations about effective mitigations, uh, looking at the international picture, looking at the impact of the introduction of testing and vaccines and of course where things have been at. Uh, with regards to cases. So today I'm going to start with the government's current position before giving a quick overview of what has changed since last year. And then I'm going to summarise the recommendations that are made in the report, as well as ending with some more general principles for a good environment at universities or indeed similar workplaces. Uh, universities create a lot of complexity because as workplaces, you've got a population where the students are adults. They come from all over the UK and internationally, all in one go and create households. There are lots of people working and living in and around universities who are not lecturers or students. Um, there are staff and students who are commuting daily. There are people studying and working in lots of different physical spaces. And there's a lot of different activities going on on and around universities from education and research, of course, to sport, social life and, and much beyond that. So for these reasons, one approach doesn't really fit all and much can be lost down in the detail that doesn't reach headlines. And so there's quite a lot in this report and in other reports that more than I can summarise here in my, in my 10 minutes, but I do urge people to take a nuanced approach to all of this um, because we lose a lot of that, um, I think. So let's start with what the government is currently saying. So as of the 17th of August, uh, there are no longer restrictions on the approach to learning and teaching in higher education as a result of COVID-19. No requirement for social distancing or other measures within in-person teaching. And then at the same time, uh, the document also states that universities should continue to make efforts to reduce the risk of transmission where possible. There also actually remains much guidance and general regulation around testing and isolating and travel and all those kinds of things on the government's website regarding universities. And at the same time, pushing autonomy um, for universities and perhaps more generally and consistently with its more general COVID approach, individual choice. Universities UK says that universities are preparing to maximize opportunities for um, a fuller experience this year but they're also saying that the public health situation remains unpredictable. So the overall context I think is quite messy, sometimes contradictory, a bit vague or opaque. And this kind of uh, mix of, of regulations and, and recommendations versus encouragements versus potential things to do creates a lot of room for interpretation, uh, misinterpretation and quite varying approaches already that we're seeing across the sector in terms of actual practice in terms of what universities are saying they're going to do with regards to different modalities for teaching and working in offices, um, or their framing generally of their, their own messages. So some are more aligned to the government mixed message, some take a different approach to the government within that wiggle room, and some are just hedging and, and making more contingent sorts of uh, statements. What has changed since last autumn then relevant to universities? Uh, 
So obviously, uh, Christine's taken us all the way through where we're at currently with the, the wave driven by Delta variant, um, including what we've seen, which is higher numbers of younger adults infected this time. Um, the Office for National Statistics recently um, reported that over 106,000 young people are living with long COVID in the UK. And of course, compared to last year, we know a lot more about long COVID. Compared to last year, probably testing is more available than ever, but we know that natural flows are limited um, and communication about what constitutes COVID symptoms, especially for Delta, is poor. Vaccine rollout is excellent and UK uptake rates are generally high. Um, and again, um, you've, you've seen Christina take us through that data, but of course universities are, are big international, lots of people moving around where we might not know quite if we're, if we're, we're mixing populations with the same kind of uptake rate anyway. Um, there's been, even before this year uh, and before the pandemic, we reported previously in Indie Sage that mental health services at universities were at crisis. And of course now it's, it's much worse, um, both at university and more generally. So you might have seen um, NHS provider estimates that 8 million people in general England population can't get specialist help. And you may have also seen a new report from the student Futures Commission, which I'm going to draw on a little bit in this presentation, um, who also talk about the issue around mental health. And they have surveyed and interviewed lots of stakeholders relevant to universities, including surveying a lot of students about what they want um, and, and so on and what's happened to them. Um, one of the things that they talk about here, again, something that our previous reports have documented and set out recommendations to address um, includes things like inequalities. Um, they also talk a lot, obviously, because a lot of the headlines and the narrative kind of focuses around online and blended teaching and learning. Um, but they, they, they note that these modalities have only been accelerated by the circumstances and only 15% of students don't want any online delivery next year. Um, they want to continue using aspects of remote learning that they found useful. And of course, you know, research has, has, has shown all sorts of things, um, of data collected during the pandemic, which is in a, a context, but nevertheless, it shows things like the remote modality enables positive change for some regarding things like um, work-life balance, childcare for staff and students, accessibility for disabled staff and students, participation and inclusivity in teaching, learning and meetings and so on. However, the report also points out that student participation in extracurricular activities where students spend most of their time more than in, in classes has declined significantly. So there are lots of things that have changed and some of the things are sort of predictable and some of the things uh, are pretty much the same. So in terms of the recommendations, we, we go into some detail in the report and I'm just going to give you sort of 10 headline comments um, today. So. The recommendations are based on, as I say, the accumulation from previous Indie Sage reports where we've been tracking the, the science and the evidence all the way through. Um, a new British medical journal piece um, setting out five recommendations for safe opening, comparing what's happened in the USA and the UK. And obviously, um, a bit like schools in England can look at what's happening in Scotland. Um, we can look in the UK at what's happening in the US where things open earlier. Um, and then also the Student Futures Commission report that I mentioned. So here are 10 of the recommendations and they probably won't be, none of them are very surprising. So the first one is maximizing vaccination uptake. Um, so obviously we've seen that vaccination uptake is, is good. Um, I think it's, it's obviously a bit slower um, in younger age groups because they've only been able to have it recently. Um, the BMJ piece um, cites modeling study that says that colleges uh, to achieve vaccine coverage, um, to return to normality in inverted commas, needs to achieve over 90%. And I guess they also talk about that will be hard to achieve. For us, um, what we talk about is the importance of just making it as easy as possible um, in a kind of strong social norm to get vaccinated and to make to, to do that by having vaccine, and as lots of universities are doing this, you know, have them, have them there accessible on campus for students and staff that are free uh, and so on, as well as testing, and are accompanied by clear information and subsequent support. A phased return to avoid mass travel um, at all the pinch points to start and end of term and, and kind of plan for that to happen. Adequate ventilation, um, which includes also communicating clearly and proactively about what each space does and does not provide. 
tracing, testing, isolating and supporting, of course, uh, Indy Sage has written and, and spoken a lot about this. Require face coverings. Um, so the government is not only not requiring face coverings for the, uni for the university uh, population, but, is also, but actually says it's no longer advising them, which is an interesting choice of wording. Um, and of course, it's different to what they're saying to the general population. And I suppose this means that universities themselves are, are, are already varying in terms of the clarity and framing and strength of their own requirements or encouragements about face coverings. Um, some are following the rather mixed government guidance and some of them are have taken them away. Some of them are continuing to require them and that's what we recommend. So more general things like promoting strong collective behavioural norms about mitigations is, is better um, than conveying individual choice around these things. A clear communication of clear messages, if we could get that, that would be great. Um, a nuanced and evidence-based approach to online and in-person learning and working. And as we've said previously, um, this kind of rather binary way in which these things get talked about isn't really helpful because apart from anything else online, has never really been about reducing, just about reducing staff student or student student transmission in classrooms. It's also enables all sorts of other strategies um, as well. And so finally, a long COVID policy for staff and students, if one isn't already in place, universities doing all sorts of things already, of course. And so we recommend this and some other things as good practice, um, sharing what different universities are doing um, if they're not already doing them. Finally then, um, just some more broad principles. So again, in, in our documents, we've reflected more broadly on the context in which universities are operating and the drivers of policy, which sometimes might be you know, economic perhaps, um, and, and people have commented much about the economic drivers of some of the things that have happened you know, throughout the pandemic, of course. So um, the first one of these is about generating a culture of strong, strong collective social norms of care and inclusion. And I've put university in the head line there in brackets just because of course this is relevant to other workplaces as well and, and more generally in society and you might have seen today a twitter thread from michael peterson in denmark who led a huge behavioral covid project and advised the government over there and one of the things that comes out very clearly in his um uh, thread about this is the, the is emphasizing the importance of high and stable levels of trust in leadership and transparent communication for adherence to everything from vaccine uptake to other measures. So we endorse that too, of course. So a workplace culture of shared responsibility for those who are clinically vulnerable and minimising their chances of being uh, infected with COVID, who might not know who, who those clinically vulnerable people are, and they might not want to disclose that either, as well as protecting everyone from infection potentially leading to long COVID. Um, We've also, you know, there's lots of lots of stuff now written about um, the financial benefits, you know, as we as we can't really always get away from economics of the global demand for university education that can't be met as one VC is written through traditional means anyway. And it's always interesting to look at um, where pedagogy and policy and things were at just before the pandemic, because obviously what we find out during the pandemic is 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 through that lens all the time. So before the pandemic, research showed that online education is on track to be mainstream by 2025. And there's lots of commentary like this in pedagogy research. So uh, these things are important to throw into the mix. This is why I say, you know, we shouldn't be having blunt discussions about these things. They're, they're more nuanced. Support staff and students to make choices that keep them physically and psychologically well, including genuine flexibility, agency and choice and avoiding presenteeism. So we know that giving people support and, and agency is ultimately more productive than enforcement, no matter what the behaviour, since a culture of agency and support is better than a culture of enforcement. So we've talked a lot also about how universities might work with each other rather than in competition. It's quite hard to crack that sort of structure in which universities operate these days, but nevertheless, um, policies that are a bit more general, setting up expectations that are clear to everyone, for example, on what's going to happen in classrooms with regards to face coverings, rather than have it all different everywhere, probably isn't very helpful for, for that clarity of message and, and then adherence. And then finally, as institutions of research and knowledge uh, learn from international experience and data, universities are the engine rooms of much COVID research and policy advice, and so universities can lead the way for other workplaces and educational settings as models of good evidence-based practice. 
I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. And that uh, new report is up there on the website. I've been following along actually on the website uh, as you've been giving us that wonderful presentation, Liz. Um, and the just the importance there of trust and transparency and good communication, which is really kind of the fundamentals of independent SAGE itself. That is why we're here. So we're going to take questions from the public now. And we start with Pamela Carantonis. Pam Pamela, are you there? Yes, you are. Lovely. What's your question? Thanks, Alice. I've got three questions, so it just depends which you've got time for. Um, the, the first question really is, what is the single most important thing that universities need to be doing in order to maintain any consistent and safe promise of face-to-face -face teaching this academic year, given that context about remote? Uh, there's a large push for face-to-face, -face, so what is the single most thing we can do to maintain any consistent and safe promise of that? We've got lots of people waiting, Pamela, so I think we might just have to take that one question. It's a big one. Um, Liz, can I come straight back to you? Uh, what do you think is the single most important thing that, that universities could be doing? I think I would just put, put it back around the frame of the first five things, actually, that we listed as the recommendations, which are hard to separate out. So vaccination, testing and tracing, face coverings, ventilation, and I've already forgotten the fourth one, but it, it, it's, it's there. I think it's hard to say a single one. And, and consistency across the sector would be great. Has anybody else on the panel got anything to add to that at all? Yes, um, Professor Susan Mickey. If I was pushed to say one thing, it would be ventilation. You know, if all the indoor spaces could be really well ventilated and if they can't be ventilated, they have really adequate filtration systems with agreed standards and monitored and clear actions as to what should happen if they fall below the standard. That would be what I would put my money on. It is creating those safe working environments, isn't it? You know, it's, it's absolutely essential that we that we start looking at um, clean air in the same way that we expect we expect clean water, um, and that we expect any kind of working environments to be adhering to to certain standards. Um, does anybody else want to? Yes, um, say Professor Stephen Reicher. Yeah. So obviously, it's absolutely crucial to focus on keeping students safe. But students have suffered considerably during the pandemic. And so what universities equally need to do, and this is equally central to the package, and, and, and Liz did talk about this, was to deal with the effects that the pandemic has had on uh, students, either those coming to university who've been at school uh, or else those already at university. One figure which just struck me as quite remarkable is that UCAS showed that there was a 450% increase in the number of applicants to university mentioning mental health problems, 450%. There is a massive mental health impact of the pandemic. And 63%, 63%, two thirds of students talk about their mental health having deteriorated, but less than half, only 42%, say the structures of support are in place in universities to deal with that issue. There is a pandemic of mental health and it's got to be dealt with and universities have got to support their students because a lot of students, uh, especially those from more deprived backgrounds, are very vulnerable. And their physical health is important, but their mental health is equally important. And I hope all universities take that very seriously. The second thing, again, this comes from the Student uh, Futures Commission, which comes out very clearly, and we know it, is the number of students who, even if they've got to university and they've done amazingly to get to university, still have missed out massively in their education. Um, there will be students who for the last two years haven't done exams and they get to university and they have to do exams. And of course, there have been massive inequalities. Those from more deprived backgrounds have lost out more. So universities need to put in place structures to support those students, to give them those skills, to be sensitive to those problems and deal with them in the assessments and so on that they give. So as I say, I think think we must focus on keeping universities safe and students and staff safe, but equally important must be a stress on dealing with those mental health those issues, that disruption to skills and that disruption, uh, disruption uh, to, confident, uh, to the confidence of students. And that's absolutely critical for universities going forward. 
Thank you very much, Stephen. And if I can add a personal um, note to this as well, just sort of picking up on some of what you were saying, particularly about mental health. Um, what I noticed last year is we, you know, we changed the way we taught completely. I teach at the University of Birmingham and um, virtually all of my teaching was, was remote last year. And um, there are some aspects of that that we are actually keeping. So, for instance, the students told us that um, some of the uh, some of the on demand um, videos that we produced, they, they really liked that if they then got to do tutorials on that video content. Um, and, I, and I think that flipped classroom idea is is working really, really well. And that, you know, that could pave the way for more small group teaching, actually, which is the you know a gold standard at university, even while we have expanding student numbers. But picking up on the mental health aspect of it, um, the feedback I got from my students last year um, was that they they appreciated the effort that I put into making my anatomy lectures for them, but that they particularly appreciated the fact that I asked them how they were. Um, and and I, I think that that just brought it home to me that that it should be it's not just the personal tutors that should be thinking about this. It's each and every member of staff that is in contact with students. We all have a duty of care and we have a duty of pastoral care to our students. That's extremely important. Thank you very much for your question, Pamela. Um, I'd like to invite Sarah Ward to ask a question now. Sarah Ward, are you there? Yes, yes. I am. Yes. Thank you. And thank you to Indie Sage for existing and everything you do. Um, so what mitigations should universities have in place to maximise or optimise the safety of their most vulnerable students and staff and their families where they may be clinically vulnerable to? Or being realistic, is it too late for that cohort to expect a reasonable level of safety? Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I think some of that is about the recommendations, the generic recommendations, but this is, is all, this is also about equity. And I wondered if Dr. Zubeda Hack might be able to comment on this particular question. Um, well, I think it goes back to some of the issues that Liz was saying, which is that we, we need to consider some of the background factors of these students. And Stephen, of course, also mentioned this, which is the background factors are not irrelevant. You know, this has been a pandemic of inequality and a pandemic of poverty. And we know that those factors have had an enormous impact on the resilience of people, on, on the extent to which people can cope, on the extent to which people can stay safe, on the extent to which people can access education. We've always known that loneliness is a huge issue for young people. Ironically, people always assume that it's elderly people that have the highest rates of loneliness, but actually it's among very young people. And we know it's the university group that, that sort of age 16 to 24 that's particularly vulnerable. So I think universities have to take that into account. Universities have to take into account that uh, students, uh, we've talked a bit, little bit about digital divide, that, that students will be in households um, where they might not have very good, especially in the parental households, where their connections might not be very good, where they can't afford things, there will be restrictions. So in that sense, universities really need to take those background factors into account and not just think about their campus, but think about where their students are coming from. Thank you very much, Zubeda. Would anybody else on the panel like to contribute to this part of the discussion? Professor Gabriel Scalley and then um, Dean, and I'll bring you in. Gabriel. I, I wanted to make just one general point, and that's about educational medicine. And it has been a neglected field for some time, and we shouldn't forget that going into this, universities uh, go in, in, came into this pandemic with really substantial reductions in the student health services right across the country over quite a number of years. Uh, for no good reason except to save money. It's not that the need went away at all. And that matches what happened in our schools as well, with very substantial uh, reductions in the number of school nurses at a time when we needed all of those educational health uh, resources. So I would hope coming out of this pandemic that we will see much more attention being paid to the health needs of students and to the specialist services that they, that they really do need in place in educational establishments to be able to keep them healthy and safe. Thank you for that, Gabriel. And Professor Dean and Pele. Um, thanks, and Sarah, thanks for your question. It is, I mean, again, a, a general point, but I, it, it needs to be said, I think, over and over again, that in the whole discussion about um, the ethics of um, enforcing vaccine passports, uh, enforcing testing and so on, 
we've also got to place ourselves and and sometimes it's very useful to put yourself in the position of someone who is vulnerable who may not be responding optimally to vaccines who may have family members who themselves are very worried about being infected and put ourselves in the position of those individuals what would you want to your university to look like to encourage you to go there and so some of the things that Liz outlined um you know vaccination uptake is 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 a critical component as well as mask wearing and obviously ventilation and i think universities also have that obligation to make the environment safe for those who are un, less able to look after themselves um through those means so it's a very important point you make sarah Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you to the others for responding there. And thank you, Sarah, for your question. I've got a question to, oh, I did have a question to read out. It's disappeared. So we'll go straight to Tim Round. Tim Round, are you here? Yes. And thank you. Um, so this week, Parliament returned to a new session. Schools will return to a new term and universities soon will. Pubs and nightclubs are all again open. So all these things are in-person activities with local mitigations, but without any mandated COVID restrictions. So is it right that so many GP practices are still not offering in-person appointments, given the inevitable impact that has on, on patients? Shouldn't it be able to be managed in um, a bit less of a black and white way than that? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question, Tim. So is it right that um, some GPs are still not offering uh, in-person appointments? Who would like to start commenting on that, Susan? Well, so many years before the pandemic, um, there's been a lot of investment, uh, research, and uh, also practical developments of telemedicine, of how to have a more blended service so that um, different kinds of services can be done um, online and not all uh, face-to-face because many appointments just don't need face-to-face. Um, So I think one of the things coming out of the pandemic is is rather like the university's discussion we've had now about um, blended learning, you know, hang on to what does work, uh, both for for those teaching and those learning, but also um, hang on to what does work, because sometimes patients do prefer being able to talk um, online directly rather than have to go into an appointment, um, and obviously saves um, resources in terms of of time for everyone. Uh, so I think the key thing is to make sure that patients' needs are met. Um, I'm not convinced uh, that given technologies are um, improving, that means keeping face-to-face exactly the same as we've always had it. Thank you very much, Susan. It does feel like we're moving much more to a kind of blended approach, doesn't it, in fact, where um, that kind of remote um, first contact might be the, the triaging and it might be that that's all that's needed um uh, and and then a, a face-to-face might might follow from that dean and did you have your hand up i just briefly and Anthony wants to come in as, as well i mean it's an important point but we've got to remember that um that primary care is a sort of contracted service to the nhs so historically um there's been less regulation really imposed on primary care but also of course um gp practices um in the same way we've talked about schools Um, You know, the building infrastructure varies hugely. Some are very small and ventilation cannot be improved. Other, you know, in others, there's a there are bigger modern um, um, buildings, um, purpose built buildings. So it's inevitable that I think that there's been a variation um, here. There's also been variation in, in the degree to which GPs and staff feel themselves vulnerable um, and in the very early days we remember that GPs were were some of the first to suffer through being infected um, uh, by, by, by patients so um, in the context of of course increasing telemedicine um, there is that variability but again um, we should be arguing that GPs premises are sufficient to provide safety both for staff as well as for patients um, but but there needs to be a lot of development and investment I think as well. Um, Anthony I think you had your hand up and then Zubeda would like to say something as well. Yeah, just, I, I mean Tim you've raised all the issues about uh, lack of mitigation and everyone going back into social contact and we've seen what's happened from Christina today with schools and hospitalizations. And we're heading into autumn stroke winter 
I'm just worried about, you know, what's going to happen actually with, uh, it, you know, it's very difficult to predict at the moment, but it, it could be that things go up. Now, defending GPs for a moment, and I would leave it up to them actually to decide how to move. But, you know, they're going to see 30 to 40 patients a day sometimes in their room. Those patients will be sick with non-specific conditions. It's a very severe risk. And, OK, there's vaccination now. But, you know, I was talking to my friends in India, in Delhi, in uh, back in May, and 250 doctors in Delhi died from the uh you know, from the pandemic. And not all of them were unvaccinated. In fact, lots had had one vaccine and about 5% had had both. So we have to think about what the risks are for GPs as well. And I would leave it up to GP practices. I'm sure many of them want to get back to some kind of face-to-face -face service. And certainly I, you know, I had a, a blood test recently, fortunately, before, the blood test closed down um but uh you know i saw a, a, actually a um an unregistered doctor from iraq took the blood and we, you know we had a one-to-one -one consultation so i think it's quite a difficult issue that you're raising i'm not sure what the correct answer is thank you anthony i think you used up the last facutana tube in britain possibly um zubeda well tim i think it's a really interesting question and my colleagues have um more than wonderfully raise some of the important issues about thinking about the context, just because everybody, all other areas such as schools are going back and so on, it doesn't mean it's necessarily the right context for GPs and also the issue about GPs like other healthcare workers. There might be some GPs who are more vulnerable, including black and ethnic minority GPs. But the other issue, Tim, and this is where I do think you raise an important point, is whether we have, there are questions about, first of all, whether blended consultations are fit for purpose, whether they work for everybody, but secondly, whether they work for particular groups in the long run. And I think what I would want to see in the long run is even if, um, even if blended consultations work well for GPs and means that they can take on more patients, that whether they carry out a consultation with their patients first, to figure out who it works for and who it doesn't work for. It may not work for elderly people. It may not work for people from certain particular, particular households. It may not work for those who don't have very good access to digital, you know, to laptops, to digital access and so on. So I'd want to see that consultation in the long run. So it's fine for GPs to protect themselves at the moment with higher cases in the community, but in the long run, community consultations would be the right way to go. Thank community consultation, much. sorry. Sorry, I meant to say community consultations in terms of whether it's right to have blended consultations. Thank you very much, Zubeda. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one last question, uh, which comes from Colin Morgan. Colin, over to you. Hello, thank you for taking my question today. Why do we seem to be able to keep our at about one, when it would be naturally at least five, but never consistently below one, which would lead to cases dying away once and for all. Thank you very much, Colin. That's a great question. I think that's one for some of the more mathematically oriented members of the Independent Sage panel. Uh, Professor Carl Friston, uh, would you like to tackle this one? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, an easy question, I'm being ironic. Um, <clears throat> I think to answer that question in the context of what we've heard today, the, um, the, the most important point is that the reproduction, the effective reproduction ratio, you know, what's actually happening on the ground today, depends very much on our social behavioral responses, mathematically the contact rates. So although you hear about the basic reproduction number being about five at the moment, which is absolutely correct. That's if our contact rates were equivalent to say pre-pandemic rates and the number of susceptible people was equivalent to say prior vaccination or any natural, uh, natural immunity. But in reality, the effective contact rate 
fluctuates with both the proportion of people who are susceptible and transmit the disease and the contact rates. And what seems to be happening is that as a population, we are sensitive to both the prevalence of the, uh, the of infection, but also the number of susceptible people. So it looks as though we're sort of always pushing the edge, where as soon as our slides starts to slide below one, we slightly increase our contact rates. And we've certainly seen evidence of that in the fluctuations that uh, Christina and, and the others have been talking about. For example, the Euros, the, uh, the festival season, the going back to, to school. So these are sort of short-term fluctuations that kick R above one, the prevalence raises, and then the contact rates fall. So um, if you sort of model that phenomena, it looks as though we're sort of always pushing the envelope so that as soon as R does start to decrease, we increase our contact rates again. So there's pressures in, in both directions. The question is, um, ultimately, we will be going to an endemic equilibrium. And is that endemic equilibrium where on average R will be equal to one? Is that going to be a high or a low prevalence? And what we want is a low prevalence. So much of the arguments that we've been having today about the best way to respond in terms of establishing social behavioural norms and epistemic trust in uh, institutions, but also having sort of the, you know, our local context sensitive, sometimes, sometimes down to the level of a single person. All of these arguments really are about bringing the prevalence down, getting on top and containing and ultimately um, eliminating uh, the virus so that that reproduction number can comfortably sit, effective reproduction number can comfortably sit at one with very, very low levels of prevalence. Thank you very much, Carl. So we don't really want levels of one when we've got 50,000 cases a day. That's not a good idea. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Gabriel to say um, something briefly, and then finally, Christina. So, Gabriel, over to you. Well, well Colin, I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I'm a public health doctor, and I believe in getting rid of infectious disease, eradicating uh, infectious disease as we managed to do with smallpox, and we're close to polio, uh, eliminating it as we've managed to do in the UK for very, very many dangerous infectious disease, and that's what we should be doing with COVID-19, but we don't have a strategy. There is no strategic plan. The government has never produced a strategic plan that says where they are trying to get to and how they will get there. And secondly, we are dabbling at keeping it under control. And every time we get it a bit under control, we take the foot off the pedal and we're not using the full range of things that we know work. The preventive measures plus the vaccination is the way we have to go. And uh, Dr. Fauci, who uh, and Christina played a clip of Dr. Fauci um, earlier in her data presentation, and he said the other night that the, the place that we were uh, that we should be treating COVID-19, it should be like measles, and we should be aiming to get it under very strict control or eliminating it. And I quite agree with that. But you can't do that if you haven't got a strategy, and if you're not bringing to bear on it all the tools that you can. Thank you very much indeed, Gabriel. Um, Christina Pargel, you had the first word today as you presented our figures. You can have the last word. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say that I, I agree with Carl that I think over the summer there has been this kind of self-limiting behaviour from the public. When they see cases go up, people are a bit more cautious, and when they go down, people relax a bit. But as we come into autumn, the equation changes because there's less choice, right? Children have to go to school. People are going back to university. People are asking people to go back into the office and go back onto public transport. And so the options that we have to respond that way are going away. And as the winter comes in, the options that we have of meeting outside are also going to be limited. So in that sense, if there was this kind of self-regulatory thing going on this summer, I don't think it can work this autumn. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for all those questions. Sorry that we haven't got round to all of the questioners today. Um, if you uh, send us your questions, we might be able to answer them for you. Um, keep watching Independent uh, Sage every Friday. Keep following us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you very much to all of the panel. Thank you very much, um, Liz, for that fantastic presentation of the university's uh, statement um and uh steve for that presentation of the who report on how europe can build back better 
Um, the new universities report is there on our website. If you're a student going off to university for the first time or, or, or going back to university, if you if you're um, if you've got a student in your family, if you're a member of staff at a university, I think it's essential reading and it's there in full. Um, so please continue to send us your questions and thoughts and please come back to watch us next week, Friday at 1.30 p.m. Stay safe. Keep well. Bye. Bye. Thank you.